and the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Thank you for coming to be with us this morning. We are so glad that you're here as we join together in worship. Let's all stand together and sing out. You were the word at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is. Nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. We are a moment, you are forever. Lord of the ages, God before time. We are a vapor, you are eternal, love everlasting, reigning on high. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain, highest praises, honor, and glory be unto your name, be unto your name. We are the broken, you are the healer, Jesus Redeemer, Lord mighty to save. You are the love song we'll sing forever. 
bowing before you, blessing your name. Sing it out. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Highest praises, honor, and glory be unto your name. Be unto your name. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Highest praises, honor, and glory be unto your name. Be unto your name. Be unto your name. Be seated, please. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this time that we can come together this morning to worship you. Father, we're so thankful for our health, and we ask you to be with those that are not able to be with us uh, due to uh, sickness or traveling. We ask that be with the families that might be traveling this week, and we pray they have a safe journey and be back with us. I ask to be with the leaders of this congregation here at Monrovia, the elders and their families, Father, that uh, we know it's a big responsibility that they have, but we're so thankful they have agreed to take on this, this uh, leadership role. Father, we pray that our missionaries, that they will be successful and we're so thankful for the generosity of our family here at Monrovia to support this work. Not only our missionaries, but our uh, local work here in this this community. I ask Father to be with Ray and and uh, be with Ray and his family, and that he. Uh, we are thankful for his leadership and also his abilities and his. Uh, a relationship he has not only with the family here at Monrovia, but also in, in this community. We ask all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Here 
Here I bow at the cross, at the cross. I surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. 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 Jesus, the Savior of the world. Jesus, the Savior of the world. Your love ran red. Your love ran red. Jesus. Jesus. There is a saying. We are what we repeatedly do. So why do we do this? Tick, tock, tick, tock. Every week, bread, wine, bread, wine. We are trying to be Christ. We are trying to be like Christ. When he instituted the Lord's Supper, he said, do this in remembrance of me. In Exodus, when, uh, when God is, is setting up the Passover, he says, when your children ask you, what do you mean by this? You will tell them, this is what it means. In Proverbs, we are told that if you train up a child in the way that they should go, when they are old, they will not depart from it. Habits are powerful. And so we do this every week. Sometimes it feels like clockwork to set a habit, to make a habit of thinking of Christ, thinking of his love, thinking of the way that he lived, thinking of the fact that he died, and the fact that he lives again. Please bow. Father, we are gathered here at this time, in this place, to, to focus on your son to focus on the life that he lived, to focus on the gift that he gave, that we can live as he lived because you love us and you gave your son on the cross for us and he was willing to have his body broken there for our sins. And we thank you. It's in his name that we pray.
Please bow. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the blood that your son shed to wash our sins away and make us your children. Give us a, a path to come to you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. Please bow. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we, we have this chance to now give uh, back as we've been blessed um, to, the, to your work here. Um, Father, we pray that, that as we do so, uh, we would do so cheerfully, knowing that you are the, the source of all things. You provide all our needs, and it all comes from you. It all belongs to you. It's in your son's name that we pray. Amen. to give you all an update on how the closet shopping day went yesterday. It went uh, fantastically well. Um, had about 128 uh, families come through uh, uh, to, to shop. Um, 434, I think, was my last count of people who were shopped for. Uh, give, gave away roughly 4,300 plus uh, articles of clothing, um, including, once again, all the socks and underwear. So. Uh, you know, thank you for all of those donations. Um, but 
huge thank you to everybody who showed up to, to help. Uh, just really appreciate it. Having all of the help that we did uh, made things go so much smoother. Um, also want to uh, give a special thank you to, to Herman Giffen, who baked cookies uh, for us. Um, I was actually sad I didn't get to have one, but um, we really appreciate, uh, really appreciate him doing that for us. Um, do, we do ask that uh, if you have further donations for the closet, if you'll hold on to those until we announce that we're ready for them. We've got some, uh, I guess, organization stuff to take care of uh, on our end before we are ready to process donations again. Um, one more quick announcement. If you have interest in helping to run the AV stuff during service, if you would please contact me. Uh, we're going to try to get a, a rotation set up uh, back there where it's not all on just two or three people's shoulders. Uh, so if you have any interest in helping to run the, the slides or the sound or anything uh, during service, please contact me. Thank you. We invite our children to come up now, but don't come up on the stage. We're going to go straight into Change for Jesus like we did last week. So um, we apologize for that, but uh, next week hopefully we'll be back to normal. So if you'll come get the cups, look at your color and look at the color on the seats over there and there and go to your section so we can spread out and cover the auditorium. If you'd like to give... If you have some loose change or something, our children will be coming by to collect that, and we'll do some good works for children with the money that we collect this morning. All right, great job, everyone. Now, while we're continuing to do that, let's sing. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit, come invade us now. We are your church we need your power in us we seek your kingdom first we hunger and we thirst refuse to waste our lives for your our joy and prize to see the captives hearts released the hurt the sick the poor at peace we lay down our lives for heaven's cause we are your church we pray revive this earth build your kingdom here let the darkness fear show your mighty Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here, we pray. Unleash your kingdom's power. Reaching the near and far. No force of hell can stop your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Fill us with the strength and love of Christ. We are your church. We are the hope on earth. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. Win this nation back. Change the atmosphere. Build your kingdom here, build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear, show your mighty hand. Heal 
all our streets and land. Set your church on fire when this nation back. Change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. We pray, Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, oh, comforter and friend, how we need your touch again, Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, let your power fall, let your voice be heard, come and change our hearts as we stand on your word, Holy Spirit, rain down. seen, no ear has heard, no mind I know what God has in store. So open up heaven, open it wide, over your church and over our lives. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind can know what God has in store. So open up heaven, open it wide, over your church and over our lives. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down, oh comforter and friend, how we need your touch again. Holy Spirit, rain down, rain down. Let your power fall, let your voice be heard. Come and change our hearts as we stand on your word. Holy Spirit, rain. I got it on. There you go. Now it's working. All right. Good morning. Everybody doing all right? I bet people wondered what I was going to do with that. This prop up here. This is not my prop. Got no clue why it's here. I thought maybe Mickey was going to use it. He didn't. I don't know if somebody's got something planned for it later. Or I don't know if one of the kids thought they'd take a nap during the service. I have no idea. But So I didn't move it since I didn't put it there. That's what they always told me. All right, handouts are coming around. Uh, they'll be to you in a minute, and we'll get started then. I got this picture up here. This is uh, Katie Ouellette. Uh Katie uh, used to attend here all the time, and then she met this guy, David, uh, David Farr, and they are engaged and going to be married soon. Katie is uh, Cynthia's niece, but she goes to church with him now up in Tennessee. But next Sunday, uh, after our services, there'll be a shower uh, you know how we typically do that where we have dessert along with what we eat and there'll be a money tree set up back over here so if you can uh, uh, remember that try to bring something that you can add to their uh, money tree next Sunday all right how many of you anybody wear contacts a few of you do all right I, I've been wearing them now for over a year, and I, I struggle to see far away, and I struggle to see close up. So they give me this deal where you have one eye, you know, has one contact. Any of y'all got that? All right. But I also found, so sometimes I wear it that way, but I found like if I'm just going to be at the computer, I'll wear both eyes where it's, you know, to see close up. When I'm playing tennis, I wear both contacts to be able to see farther away. That just, that helps with the tennis ball. But then there are days like today when I put the two contacts in, I don't know if any of you ever have this problem, and one of them's lost in my left eye, and I can't find it. 
And so it's just sort of rolling around in there. And I always say that to say, that means I can't see you and I can't see that either. So we'll just see how it goes. Uh, we're going to go back. I said we, uh, last, you know, we've, done, we've done three weeks talking about really around, centered around the, the thought of the resurrection. Uh, if you're new with us or visiting, there's a book. Uh, there was a copy of it up here. Believe that we've been using. It's gone. Uh, working through that, a lot of you got one of those books. If you're interested, we still got several uh, weeks that we'll talk through it. But it's just different subjects each week. And so we're going to get back into that uh, series today. Now, it's going to fall just right for the summer. For June, July, and August, we'll be working through the fruits of the Spirit, which uh, I think will make a nice summer, sort of like a mini-series within the series. But it gets to that point in the book. And so that's what we'll be focused on uh, all through the summer. Today, though, we're down to uh, spiritual gifts. And we, we could spend a lot of time just on this subject, but we're going to work through it this morning. That's why you've got a worksheet. It'll give you something you can uh, take and I hope uh, try to think about, process the main points that we're going to talk about. Uh, the sheet will get you through the first part of the lesson, then we'll have a, a little video, and then we'll sort of wrap it up at the end. Several uh, different places we could go to talk about spiritual gifts. But let me ask you this. How many of you sort of believe you have, you got a real clear understanding of what spiritual gifts are and how they work and relate in your life? Okay, that's what I thought. Most people don't, uh, especially if you grew up in a, a, a church, and the Churches of Christ would be one example, but if you grew up in a church where spiritual gifts were not really a focus of that much discussion other than talking about how they were back in the old days, and we, you know, we would talk about speaking in tongues and how that worked or didn't work, or you might talk about prophecy, but most of us, if we have spent much time discussing spiritual gifts, it was probably talking about Speaking in tongues and what that meant at that time compared to what people do today. Would that be true? You, know, you, you, you tend to think of that more. So we think of spiritual gifts a lot of times in some, I would say weird way, but you know, some like that, that's out there. Like, uh, you know, don't, don't really understand it, so we, we stay away from it a little bit. We're going to try to simplify it this morning because I really believe it is fairly simple. Paul in 2 Timothy is writing to... Timothy. And you know the relationship of Paul and Timothy. In fact, he starts off in, uh, when, he, when he's writing this letter to Timothy, telling him, my dear son. So, you know, he views him. Uh, they, they had a very, very close relationship and a mentoring type relationship that Paul had uh, with young Timothy. It's interesting. This is the last written letter we have of Paul that's recorded for us to read. So it, it, I also find it very interesting in like his last words that he's putting on paper for us. Uh, he, he's writing this message to Timothy, and he opens up just with a very affectionate opening, telling Timothy, uh, you know, my dear, dear son, he tells him how much he longs to see him again. He even emphasizes, and I'm not sure exactly what point Paul was talking about in his relationship with Timothy, but he even says, you remember, or I want you to remember how much it meant to you when you, you shed tears for me. So Paul has, again, a deep affection for this younger man, Timothy. He also highlights the strength of his faith. He talks about Timothy getting his faith from his grandmother Lois and then from his mother Eunice, and he said the faith that they had has now also been in you. So after he opens up his discussion to Timothy, then he comes into a statement that we're going to use to launch into our discussion. He says, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hand. Now, we know that there was a, a, a special measure of the Holy Spirit that some of them had because they didn't have the written word. They didn't have the guidance that we have today, and they, they had unique abilities that we don't have, just like Paul writing this letter to Timothy. Certainly, Paul's writing in his own words, but as we know, he is what? We call it inspired. There's, there's a measure of the Holy Spirit 
working through him that, that none of you are, are going to be writing any parts of the Bible, right? We, we understand that. So they did have something, a, a special relationship with each other in the Spirit. But I really, so I don't want you to think about that. We, we, don't, we don't lay hands and the Spirit doesn't work through us in that way. But what is key is how the Spirit works in you. I won't say how, but the way that you pay attention to it and bring it alive in your life hasn't changed. Even though Timothy had a gift that you won't have, what is Paul asking him to do? He say, he's saying, I want you to fan that into flame. We can relate to that. A lot of us can that uh, grew up, you know, back when we were younger and spent a lot of times in the woods. Maybe some of you that do some camping. Any of you ever had a fire and, you know, there was some embers in the fire that was just a, a, you know, a, a little bit there, but it wasn't really flaming. And what would you do? You used to have, we used to have fans. You know what I'm talking about? And if you would fan that ember, what would happen? It, it will, yeah, it'll light up, right? It will fan it into a, a burning flame. And this is a picture that he's giving. He said, I want you to fan into a burning flame the Spirit, the gift, really, that the Spirit of God has given you. How do you think we would fan something into a flame in our life? I find it very interesting. So when you fan, what are you, what are you putting out there that's going to help this rise into a flame? Wind, right? Yeah. Why? You're putting some air in. You know, there, there, there's all kind of chemistry associated with that, but we're just going to focus on the fan creates a wind that creates an action inside those embers, right? What is the wind in our life? The Holy Spirit. Is the Holy Spirit not the wind? Continually talked about through Scripture as being the wind. So if I want to fan, I want the wind to be moving, and that can create this flame in my life. So what I want to do then is really focus on how I excite the Spirit in my life, All right? Just keep that thought as we go forward, okay? So we're going to ask a few questions. You've got them on your sheet. I encourage you to write these down and, and take them and pray about them, think about them, all right? What is a spiritual gift? All right, we'll start there. Now, I, I took uh, a little liberty this morning to take, we're going to look at a few different scriptures. We're going to look at them through some translations of Scripture that have taken place over time so we can maybe even see how this can be confusing, but really it's not if we make it into language that we really understand, all right? And that this isn't to be critical or favor any particular uh, translation of Scripture, but it's to show you how difficult sometimes things can be. Most of us grew up, or at least I did, a lot of you probably did, reading the King James Version, and that was about all. And here's Romans 1, 11, and 12. For I long to see you that I may impart unto you some spiritual gift to the end you may be established. I, I talk that way quite often, right? I'll, I'll tell people oftentimes, you know, I'm going to come and I'm over your house because this will help you to the end that you may be established, right? Do y'all talk that way? What does that mean? Again, this isn't a favor, but, but you know, we read things a lot of times, right? And you just sort of read it, but it really doesn't mean anything because you don't think and talk that way. You would have to stop and really process what, what does that mean to try to get an understanding. That is that I may be comforted together with you by the mutual faith, both of you and me. Okay. The NIV, which probably has been used more in the last, uh, you know, I don't know, 20, 25 years, makes it a little easier, I guess, to understand. It says, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. Impart. Do you, do you talk, I mean, do y'all go to people's houses a lot of times and impart things to them? Do you? No? So, I mean, even that language is a little difficult, right? Not, not, so, impart. When I'm going to impart something to you, does that mean I'm, what, I don't, I'm not, sh all right. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Now, I like the way that ends. That, that you know, that, that's making that a little more alive for me. Here's a version. It's called the easy-to-read version. Again, I'm not 
promoting one, but this one really sort of makes this easier to understand. I want very much to see you and give you some spiritual gift to make your faith stronger. Right? When he says, give you some spiritual gift, that, that even is a little confusing. So what do you think that means? Paul's going to go over there and give him a gift? Hey, what, what, do you, what does that mean? Because, you know, in, in the, uh, again, King James, it says, I want to come and I want to impart this to you. And so confusion here can be, okay, is he coming to give them a gift that they will now have in their life? And that's not, re- that's not really what he's saying. He's saying, I want to yeah, come give you the gift, but what he's saying is, I want to come share with you the gift that I have. Paul has a particular spiritual gift that he wants to come, and he wants to impart to them. He wants to give to them. He wants to share it with them. But Paul's really saying, I want to come because I want to share my life with you. All right? I mean, I want us to help each other with the faith that we have. And this is where I I really like the way this one ends. Your faith will help me and my faith will help you. Keep that in mind. That is what all this is talking about. Spiritual gifts are workings of the Holy Spirit through me where I help you and the Holy Spirit is working through you also and you help me. All right, a couple of simple definitions. Spiritual gifts, abilities given by the Spirit which express our faith and aim to strengthen the faith of others, right? And the the key here is that first few words. It's abilities given by the Spirit. I can keep the Father and the Son and the Spirit separate as you always keep them together as God. But who designed you? God, okay? God, which part? Interesting, when you really look through, the Father is the one that had more, as the Scripture relates to it, more of an emphasis in our design, all right? So, and this, this is important, because all of you have, by design, abilities, right, that are above others. You know, Mickey has the ability to sing and to lead singing. I don't really have that ability, Jeff has the ability to lead teams and groups of teams and to manage and, you know, various other things. But, uh, you know, we could go around around here and everybody here has natural abilities, we call them, right? Abilities. And they were given by the Father, all right? And they just sort of work in our, our world and in our life. And we also can use those in a spiritual way, all right? Like, I, I have an ability or... Sometimes I think I might to, to stand in front of people and communicate a message, all right? But that is a natural ability. I use that outside of a spiritual environment just as well as I use it inside a spiritual environment, okay? Everybody understand what I'm saying? Those are not spiritual gifts. They are just natural abilities by your design. Spiritual gifts are abilities. Now, they could tie into the same natural ability, But a spiritual gift is an ability that is given by the Spirit, God the Spirit, for a particular purpose, and that is to strengthen the faith of others. That is is an ability that is beyond and separate and apart many times from a natural ability you have. This is an ability that will only be realized and only be utilized when you put yourself into spiritual relation and spiritual environments for that opportunity to be fulfilled. Does that make sense? Follow me? All right. I know you said, I don't, I don't, I don't get that. All right. Let's go to another definition. It's the vehicle by which we disperse. God's grace is our spiritual gift. The vehicle by which we disperse this fact that God's grace is our spiritual gift. All right, and when I, some of you that struggle with English, all right, I want to help you because I knew somebody would say, well, wait a minute, Ray, you spelled that wrong, it's disperse. No, you disperse when you equally separate something out among people. You disperse when something has been flowed into you and you're going to flow it out to others. This is the way God's grace is. It's the disbursement. It is me taking God's grace that's flown into me and then flowing that out into other people's lives 
the way, the vehicle that that happens is my spiritual gift. You with me? This, know, this isn't easy, but you with me? We're, again, we're going to bring it home toward the end, but just keep in mind this thought. My spiritual gift is how I strengthen your faith. And it's the way that God's grace, God's love, all that I am from God flows from me to somebody else. How that works, that is really my spiritual gift. All right, who receives spiritual gifts? This is a little easier. Okay, back in the King James, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Y'all got that? Does that make sense to you? What's the word with all mean? Any of you ever seen that word? Probably other than reading in the King James Version, you probably haven't. That's an old word that in our generation, in our lifetime, it's really not a part of our natural language. So we really don't know exactly what that means. Right? The NIV, again, made it a little clearer. It says, now to each one, of, now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. Right? We, we're beginning to sense this. So, so what was the question? Who receives spiritual gifts? Is that right? All right. So what is it saying? Well, let's make it really easy to understand. Something from the Spirit can be seen in each person. The Spirit gives this to each one to help others. All right. So who receives spiritual gifts? Everybody. All right. Everybody. Every Christian, every uh, uh, follower that has, you know, uh, again, you, you, the follower of God, the Spirit is going to work through them. Or let me put it this way. The Spirit wants to work through them, right? If we don't make opportunity available for the Spirit to work through us, is the Spirit going to work through us? No, because we still have our free will. We have that choice, right? So if we're not making that opportunity available, it can't happen. But the Spirit wants to, desiring to work through us. All right, who assigns spiritual gifts? All right, so we've established, we, we, well, we didn't really, we, we, we tried to get a, a, a general understanding of what a spiritual gift is, and we've, Understood that everybody has the opportunity to receive a spiritual gift. Now, who assigns them? Again, the King James Version says, But all these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Okay? Sort of understand what that means. The NIV says, All these are the work of one of the same spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. All right? That pretty well makes sense. And then the easy-to-read version says, One spirit... The same Spirit does all these things. This makes it very clear. The Spirit decides what to give each one. All right? So who determines your spiritual gift? The Spirit does, right? The Spirit. Not the Father, not the Son, the Spirit. Certainly God is always God, but this is a working of the Spirit. And the Spirit decides what your gift is. Now, how many gifts are there? All right? This is, you you got to stay with me because you've got some blanks on your paper there if you're filling that up. All right, there's four different places we have some list of spiritual gifts. Romans 12, you can see there's seven of them, right? Seven listed. Now, you can go look at a variety of lists, and th these numbers won't be exactly the same, but just for your sake here, right? In Romans, we see seven. Over here, if you see them in italics, that means they've already been mentioned somewhere else. So in 1 Corinthians 12, how many do you see? There's 13, but two of them's already been mentioned, right? So that'd be 11. Is that right? 11 plus 7, that'd be how many? 18. In Ephesians 4, you have five listed, but four, or I'm sorry, three of them have already been mentioned. So that'd be up to what? 20? And then 1 Peter 4, there's two, and those have already been mentioned somewhere else. So we came up with 20. Other lists will have 21. Others have 22. I've seen some with like 18 or 19, depending on how they break these down. Here's the point. How many spiritual gifts are there? It is unlimited, all right? This is not given to us as an all-inclusive list. The Spirit can work through you in a variety of ways. There's a variety of talents and abilities and getting vehicles for the Spirit to work through someone and flow some measure of strength into someone else's life. So don't get too wrapped up. And how many there are are especially this question, what is my gift? You ever seen those things where you, you know, take this personality test or whatever so you can determine what your spiritual gift is? Most of those are really set up and designed for you to be able to identify what natural abilities you have from God the Father in your immediate design. All right? Does it make sense? 
We're not really trying to decide that. If you want to do that, there's all kinds of secular personality tests where you can go and understand We're really what, by your natural ability, what strengths you have. Here is the key. The Spirit will work through you and give you a gift that may be common throughout a lot of your life. It may be common just to that one interaction and that one moment. The Spirit has the measure to work in your life and provide a special gift for that particular time. And now I'm not talking, if anybody says, okay, what do you say? I'm not talking any miraculous, no, you know, don't, don't be going out and trying to lay your hand on somebody and you know, uh, heal them of some deadly disease, pray for them. God can do that. You can't really do that. He didn't give you that. But he may give you the ability to have comforting words that provide healing and strengthening of faith in somebody else's life at this moment. And it may not be your gift, really, of conversation. But he may, in that moment, put that there. You just never know what God might open up when you put yourself in that position and you seek his will and his working through you. All right. Here's the big question. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 7 says, Something from the Spirit can be seen in each person. The Spirit gives this to each one to help Others. All right. If you got lost in that discussion, understand. Come back now and hear me. Okay. Everybody back. Here's the here's the thing. Don't get so wrapped up in what you know. If if you don't really want to get deep into understanding spiritual gifts, that's all right. I do ask you to accept that the Spirit has the ability. This is God we're talking about. The Spirit has the ability to work through you and to create a work in you that you would have never thought possible. Okay. Accept that, please. But here's the most important thing. Identifying what that is is not the most important thing. This is the most important thing. Do you really desire? Is it really a deep desire of you to strengthen the faith of other people? Or is your spiritual walk mainly about you getting what you want when you want it and you being satisfied? All right? Understand that? Because that's two very big differences. A lot of us are looking for, and you know, I talk about this often, and a lot of us are looking for in our spiritual environments, just like we do in our corporate environments, or our school environments, or our sports environments, or whatever they are, we're looking for something from me. So if that is your goal, understand the Spirit is probably not going to work through you. Because here's where you live. You grumble, basically, all the time, and you never allow God's glory to shine through you because you're never getting what you want totally, so you're always sort of grumbling. That's the way the world works. Y'all go, you ever around anybody that grumbles? Always. And you probably have grumbled too. I have too, as we've noted before. We grumble when the world's not meeting our expectations, right? And that, then we just go to grumble. But if my real focus is at I interact with people and in environments is how can I strengthen the faith of those I'm around, I probably don't get here. And that's a wonderful thing. Watch this video. The, the, the quality of it's not great because this is an original NASA video from 1969. 20 seconds and counting. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. Tower cleared. Program. Neil Armstrong reporting their role in pitch program, which puts Apollo 11 on a proper heading. Plus 30 seconds. two miles. All 11 
Houston, you're good at one minute. Downrange one mile, altitude three, four miles now. Velocity 2,195 feet per second. Were any of you working for NASA back then? Anybody in here? A few? Uh, that still amazed me, 1969. Apollo missions. I remember those when I was a kid. I don't know if y'all did. That, that was, you know, it's a pretty big deal when they when they would lift off or you know the day that uh, that was happening. Uh, we everybody paid attention, and when we walked on the moon, uh, that, that was that was big stuff, right? 1969. That still amazes me. They went to the moon, and the car that I rode in, you had to roll the window down with one of these. Y'all, most of y'all don't even know what that is, right? One of those. Y'all remember that? Didn't even have air conditioning, and there they are going to the moon. Amazing. Over one, here's why I show you that though, over one million parts, over one million parts in that rocket ship. You know, like if, if in a body of believers, if you had like, you know, 50% of the people really engaging and sharing their spirit. Their spiritual gift with the other 50% would be celebrating, right? I'm pretty sure the astronaut sitting up on top of that missile that was taking off wouldn't have been really happy if somebody told him, hey, you understand, there's over a million parts and probably about 50% of them is going to work when we try to lift this thing off. What do you think? I don't know. I, I know they have redundancy and, and you know, ability for certain parts to, to fail because there's something else behind it, but they were looking pretty much for 100% success men's lives, and in a lot of ways, the future of a country relied on this. Well, the future of God's called out, his body, relies on the very same thing. As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker, indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has put the body together, giving greater honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. All right, y- y'all know that section of Scripture, and, and the deal is, Folks, please hear this, okay? We need everybody, and I say we, I'm not talking about Monrovia. I'm talking about we as other followers of Jesus need all followers of Jesus engaging with each other. So we create the opportunity for the Spirit to work through each of us and build up the faith in the lives of others around us. All right? We need that. Again, I'm not talking about a particular church body. I'm just talking about God's body. Needs all the parts engaging together. You see what happened, and we haven't got time for a lot of history. The Dark Ages, y'all know what the Dark Ages were, right? I mean, they lasted for a thousand years, essentially, when there was not much communication of education and learning throughout the world, small pockets of people really contained all the intelligence, and it worked that way in God's body. You know, for many, many years, Christian people only could understand what God's Word was speaking into their lives by the very few that could read God's Word explaining it to them. Well, what happens in that? They explain to you what they want you to know, and what they don't want you to know, they don't maybe explain to you. Not that everybody was evil, but there was a lot of corruption in that whole setup. You understand? And most people were ignorant to really how God works because they didn't have the ability to have God's Word. You understand that? I mean, in in most environments, very few people could actually read the language. Most were uneducated. They only could hear what somebody told them, and they were generally told things that people had a particular reason for telling them to bring them to a particular belief that benefited them, all right? Then we had what was called the Reformation Movement. That's been going on for a couple hundred years. But when we had the Reformation Movement, a lot of good people, a lot of great goals and hopes. But we set up, and we've, you know, I know y'all feel like I, I maybe fuss about it too much, but we set up a lot of structure in those words. 
are in, the, in those worlds. And so what a lot of structure does, it's just like a couple of conversations I've had this week, what a lot of structure does is create where we're looking for somebody else to create an environment for me to work in or in, to engage in. And the worst thing that we did was created, in a, especially in our modern world, is the biggest experience or the main experience or the priority of experience with God in our culture, in our society, is what? I know i got to shut up. We're going to class. But y'all got to hear this. Our biggest experience and our priority of experience and the experience with God and others is what? It's this. Across America, the vast majority of people that have experience with God are doing it right now in a building somewhere in very large groups, right? If the Spirit is working in here this morning, and I don't mean that negative, but if he is working, there's really right at this moment only one person that is even given the opportunity for the Spirit to work through, and who is that? I'm the only one right now, really, unless he's working through you in some kind of a, a expression of emotion or facial expression or something. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, y'all, you get, you get me, right? So the biggest place that we bring the most people to experience God and build each other's faith up, we create an environment where most people do not even have the opportunity for the Spirit to work through them, okay? Now, again, that's not saying this is a bad experience at all. But here's what I'm saying, folks, and I'm closing here. Dive into some opportunity in your life that creates... It facilitates a place where the Spirit can work through you. Okay? Now, I'm not, this isn't about trying to get more teachers to sign up out there. I'm asking you to go create and facilitate opportunities in your life to engage with other like-minded people that are trying to serve God in ways where the Spirit can work through you and work through them, and you can build each other's faith up. That is of the highest priority with your time and your resource and your experience with God. When we are all collectively doing that, this experience will be better. We'll have more opportunity to share with each other how the Spirit has worked through our individual lives during the week. Rather than sitting dry waiting on something to flow into my life, it's just not going to flow into your life if it's not flowing out of your life. That's what's so weird about the relationship with God. The way our relationship with God flows into us is by something flowing out of us. So opposite from the way typically things work. So you get it? Dive in. Just dive in. And you'll be really, really amazed at how God can work through you. Thank you for time. Stand and sing. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Sing aloud to God. Let the people shout before his throne. Hallelujah. Sing aloud to God. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise his name from the ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea. Let all creation praise his name. Shout hallelujah, 
shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah, shout hallelujah unto the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this time we had to come together and worship you, Lord, and we thank you so much for this church family, and uh, thank you, uh, Lord, for the closet going well yesterday, all those families being helped, Lord, and I thank you so much for uh, this time that we get together each week, and I pray, Lord, that you'll continue to watch over us through this week, help us to be mindful of the things that we do, and glorify you in it, Lord, and in your name we pray, amen.